to everyone. Um, let me say that I'm delighted to be here. Um, let me recognize the efforts and success of KBA in managing to host these types of events, which are very important, not just for Kenya, but for the whole of Africa and for women as a whole. I'd also like to give special recognition to the CEO of KBA, uh, fellow central bank colleagues, most of whom I know, which I'm happy to say, my friend Arumna, MasterCard and other sponsors, and all of us who are here today, who are just as important as the people that I have just mentioned. Special thanks to those who have organized it. I know Nuru has spent a lot of hours on this. Um, I want my remarks today to be a little different from what we normally talk about on African women. Um, with my team over the last two to three weeks, we've been researching and looking for positives as well as the challenges. And so I hope in my remarks, we're able to reflect those well into the content of this forum and to bring it um, to a new, a new way of looking at women. Firstly, we know that women constitute in Africa 50% of the population um, and play a key role in all the economies constituting the majority of the entrepreneurs. They are the backbone of agriculture and food production, 80% of its food, and most of the informal workers in the African subcontinent are women. What have we done well? Um, when I look to see what we've done well, what I see is that the majority of entrepreneurs are women. And when we look at the World Economic Forum Global Gender in, uh, Gap, in, Gap Index, what we see is that in 2018, 68% um, was the score given. And in this year is 68.6. Now, maybe we could say we're not moving fast enough, but at least we're moving in the right direction. And when we look at mobile money and the gender gap, um, what we see from GSMA is that 10% is the difference of 10% between the number of men that are participating in, local, in, in mobile money and the number of women. As an older African woman, I know for sure that in my time, most of the percentile differences between um, these, these numbers, the gender gap numbers, used to be 30. So to see that 10% in my, in, from my perspective is, is, is an improvement. And in Kenya, this was, is 6%. Across um, Africa, 69% of women owned mobile phones. I remember participating in one of the um, presentations done on mobile digital economy by India and seeing that it's a much lower number in the Indian subcontinent. So in that sense as well, Africa has taken some, some leadership um, in their role. The thing I always find very interesting, and I gave a presentation on it about two or three years ago, is actually the percentage of women in C-suits, in, in, in senior positions, in, in various institutions. And what we see, which I find quite fascinating, is that Africa leads all other regions globally in the proportion of females on company boards. I do know, as Habil has told us um, just a while ago, that in the financial sector, we're lagging. But what the point that I'm making is you can see there on the screen that about 25% of all boards are in Africa are occupied, position, board positions are occupied by women. Um, these are gains that have been made. And the point I'm making here really is don't let them go. We must make sure that whatever we have achieved, we don't slip back. But in, in fact, what we do is we grow more um, and not let go of the gains that have been, the gains that have been made. So let's talk about gender equality. And I thought long and hard about this. And what struck me is it's always easier to discriminate if the discrimination aspect is identifiable. What am I saying? What I'm saying is if you're a black person, nobody needs to interrogate as to whether you're black or not. And if you're a woman, nobody needs to interrogate as to whether you're a woman or not. And so when just like Black Lives Matter, women matter. And this is where the discrimination continues without end because there's no need to interrogate and find out is this a woman or is this a black person? It is so obvious. And so it allows, it, it, gives, it gives oxygen to discrimination. And this point is the point that I think we really need to make clear as we go forward. 
Women are 50% of the world's population, but they own just 1% of the world's wealth. This is a discrimination. Unless you're telling us that women are somehow subhuman, sub, um, a subspecies. What we're saying is it, it just cannot be feasible that you can be 50% and only own 1%. The performance of women-owned businesses is also a big concern because as much as we are the biggest entrepreneurs in the African continent, what we see is we are smaller. We have fewer employees, we have lower average sales, and the value of our companies is less. And again, this talks to discrimination. And when you think long and hard about it, it could be because women can't get finance. It could be because they have a lot of family pressures, family um, responsibilities so they can't focus on their businesses. There's so many issues that come in there that tell us that, you know, support is needed. Support is needed in this respect. And the point that I made earlier, that whatever gains we've made, we should not allow them. Here what we're seeing is actually in the, in the fourth industrial numbers are declining. Our numbers are declining. So we're not gaining in that. We're actually going backwards. But when it comes to countries where girls do not get equal opportunity, Africa is not in the top five. Africa is not in the top five. What are the main barriers for women in Africa? And you know, to me, it seems quite obvious. Where and when you're born has great implications on the women. And so when we're focusing policy and support and relief and protection and laws, we have to think about this very seriously. If you're born in Nairobi as a girl child into a middle family, then when we talk about discrimination, probably your, 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 your visibility of that discrimination is less. If you're born in one of our dry areas away from urban um, structures um, and if you're born into certain locations where there's cultural and behavioral discrimination discriminatory practices access to education access to phone ownership inheritance of property uh, the role you play in the house and obviously you can't even think about access to finance this is the area that we need to focus on and even religions need to take deep look at themselves because they too have been perpetuating part of this discrimination and we need to really address it as we go forward. Cultural norms are the most fantastic things in Africa and the African cultures are often part of what pulls us together and holds us together but there are also aspects of the cultural norms that define roles and social norms that are discriminatory and yet we're not addressing them. We're, well let me not say we're not addressing them let me just say, we're not making great inroads in addressing them. My view on all of this is that the best way to overcome much of what we're talking about here is to give education both to girls and to boys, because educated individuals tend to have less ownership of some of these discriminatory practices than non-educated. Priority actions. Empower women to stand out in their differences. Let them be independent and strong. I think what we see is always uh, a statement that women are being protected, that what we're doing is helping the women, that what we're doing is looking after the women. But actually, let us be independent and strong and protect and respect the value that they bring. You know, there's an American saying, apple pie and motherhood which is something they say nobody dislikes, but also it's used in a very disrespectful way when they talk about it in the sense of, oh, everybody can do that. But can you? Being a mother is not an easy thing. So protect and respect the value that they bring. Some of what we've been doing in the past doesn't seem to be working. And we keep repeating it. Does it help us? if we just keep repeating recommendations that have not worked. Can we please do our data analysis and look and see what is working and leverage and push that success? I was very happy to hear the previous speaker 
talking about digital finance technology and entrepreneurship, because that's where we see the success coming in the Kenya context, and also where we see the success coming when we look at the data Pan-African. What is the impact of COVID-19 on women? Well, as we know, this has been a pandemic that has rendered millions of businesses and, and people out of employment. Um, it, is, it has really hurt us globally, and it has had a huge impact on the African continent. People talk about the fact that the, the impact on the African continent is less than the impact in other continents. I think that's not really the point. I don't think we want to get into a bidding war on who was injured less. I think what we're saying is that we've all been injured. And it's disproportionate as usual on women. Women were more likely to be in the informal sector and more women have disproportionately lost their jobs. But there has been a silver lining. I know in the, Afri in the Kenyan context, more women have opened businesses during this period. As I say, these small, small value businesses, but there have been more women, which shows their, their resilience and it shows their propensity to be innovative. And the area that seems to be supporting and assisting is the digital services, the digital tools and digital financing innovations. Let us redefine leadership. Often when you go places, what you define as leadership is a role occupied by a man in a very male um, perspective. But is that really all that leadership is? It is, of course, one, one part of leadership and men are leaders and they have every right to be leaders. But that, does that define leadership in its entirety? Women remain central to any society. And I think where you see that women do not thrive, actually the society falls apart. Where women do not thrive, the society falls apart. Women are a, 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 an essential part of any society's thriving um, and growth. A woman is not a man. I often laugh when I think about how I participate in a very male dominated financial sector. And I've always been very, very difficult in the sense of being defined in a certain way. I remember if I give you a small story, one of the first roles I had at the Central Bank of Kenya um, was with the other regulators. And I was the only woman in the room. And at the end of the conference, they were giving um, uh, awards to people. And it's only at this point they said, okay, deputy governor will be very happy um, you know, for you to come up. And I said, no. I said, I am not a flower girl. I'm here in my own right. I'm here in my own capacity. Get somebody who can give those awards. If that's all you think I'm worth, then next time don't invite me to your, your, your conference. I am here in my own capacity. I'm here in my own rights to be part of um, the decision-making process. So a, a woman is not a man. Her contribution is different and it is valuable. Let us be proud of the differences in the value that women bring to households, to the marketplace, and to the broader economy. Leadership does not just look like men. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, MC, um, for your very kind introduction. Uh, let me start by thanking Ms. Nuru Mugambi for inviting me to give this opening keynote. Nuru Mugambi, the CEO, Dr. Habil Olaka, and all of their colleagues at the Kenyan Bankers Association Secretariat have shown visionary leadership by starting this inaugural regional conference. I must also commend them for the distinguished speakers and leaders from the private sector and the public sector that have been invited to share their knowledge at this conference. I want to particularly acknowledge all of the pioneer female deputy governors of central banks. And of course, my sister, 
Sheila Mbijiwe, the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. She, along with the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Njoroge, and their colleagues have been an example for many African central banks to emulate. They've been at the forefront of building a first class financial system that has leveraged innovation and technology to broaden access to finance for women and other vulnerable groups. I remember fondly when I visited Nairobi last year to attend the FinTech Festival that the Central Bank co-sponsors annually now with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, how proud I was of what Kenya has been doing in terms of leadership in this area for our continent. What I thought I would do with my own, uh, the few minutes you've given me, is to focus on how we can leverage women to unleash Africa's full potential. I will present the state of the continent and then reinforce the case that both the senior vice president of MasterCard uh, and the deputy governor have made about how you can unleash the potential of women and therefore unleash the potential of Africa. First, post COVID, Africa is facing its first recession as a region in over 25 years. The economic crisis that has resulted from COVID-19 has been multifaceted. We've had devaluation of many African currencies. We've had a steep decline in commodity prices. And we've had even the decline of remittances into the continent to name a few aspects. The African Development Bank estimates that Africa's GDP of about $2.6 trillion will contract by 6% in 2020 as a result. Africa still has many fragile economies. For example, the average rate of poverty for Sub-Saharan Africa is still more than 40%. We still have more than 50% of Sub-Saharan African adults that do not have an account with a banking or financial institution. The World Bank estimates that Africa's GDP per capita at only $1,970 and much lower than any other region in the world will contract this year by 6%. Yet Africa has abundant wealth. It is rich in natural resources. Africa has 30% of the world's known minerals, whether it's bauxite, coltan, cobalt, copper, diamond, gas, gold, iron ore, oil, platinum, silver, uranium, to name just a few. Africa has 69% of the world's platinum. 60% of the world's cobalt, 56% of the world's natural diamonds, 25% of the world's gold, 18% of the world's uranium. And I can go on and on. Democratic Republic of mineral resources than any country in the world. Indeed, the value of its unexplored mineral wealth is more than $24 trillion more than the GDP of the wealthiest country in the world, the US, which is $21 trillion. What about agriculture? Africa is also rich in agriculture. As you all know, 60% of the world's arable land uh, is uh, in, uh, in Africa. But for me, the most important wealth that Africa has is its people. Its current population is 1.3 billion people, and this will grow uh, as we go through the years. This is a huge untapped market. It is the most youth, youthful population in the world as 60% of Africans are below the age of 25 years. If we're going to succeed 
we're tackling what has been the most challenging crisis in our lifetimes. We have to unleash Africa's abundant wealth. And to do that, you have to leverage Africa's economic powerhouse. That for me is a game changer. Why do I say so? There's been a number of data that's been presented by the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. Let me add a few. If you take agriculture, if men and women have the same access to land, technology and capital in Africa, we can feed an additional 150 million people, according to the African Development Bank. Indeed, McKinsey estimates that gender parity, where all countries are as good as the best in the region, could unleash $306 billion in GDP. And if we completely close the gap, it could be $1 trillion in GDP by 2025. How should we do that? Let me give examples of the opportunities that Africa has to offer. Those opportunities abound in every country and in every sector, agriculture, climate action, creative industry, whether it's the movie industry, the music industry, the fashion industry, in education, in health, in finance, in manufacturing, in mining, in technology, in trade, just name it. The opportunity is everywhere for all of us to think about how we can do more to tap into them. Let me share a few details. Climate action. Climate action is a $26 trillion economy. And Africa is uniquely positioned to benefit from the global energy transition because of its clean energy wealth, whether it's solar, wind, hydro, geothermal. We have a number of countries that are leading the way. Morocco has the world's largest concentrated solar facility, and it's already providing clean energy to 2 million Moroccans. South Africa's renewable, renewable energy independent power producer program is one that is being emulated in other parts of the world. Of course, Mkopa, a Kenyan solar energy company that was launched in 2012 that ensures that energy is easily accessible to the ordinary person. Entrepreneurship, and I think the deputy governor also mentioned this. Absolutely important. The Boston Consulting Group estimates that you can unleash up to $5 trillion if men and women participate equally as entrepreneurs. We must leverage innovation in finance to close what is today a $42 billion gap. Also has been mentioned some of the systemic barriers that face women in respect of accessing finance. Let me add that we must strengthen our financial markets. We must ensure that banking and credit markets have systems to scale up credit so that we can have a revolution of providing finance easily to women, small and medium scale enterprises. If China's and financial can lend 600 million small and medium scale enterprises through their three minutes to apply, one, one um, second to approve, no human intervention, we certainly can scale up the systems that we have so that we can achieve the same. We must ensure that our capital markets offer sufficient patient medium to long-term capital. Insurance must provide risk management products to protect African next entities from shocks because we're going to see shocks as we go further up in the future. Financial inclusion strategies are key so that all women are financially literate and can be empowered to participate actively in the economy. The next one that I want to highlight is about trade. Women are the backbone of the retail and wholesale value chains across Africa. I remember fondly on the West African um, a peninsula, 
the Mama Benzes, the women who trade from Cameroon to Senegal, who face some of the most difficult barriers to making sure that they can trade and grow their businesses. I am absolutely excited for them about the African continental free trade area. That is a game changer, which has been described as our best economic recovery plan. The next one, the fourth industrial revolution, which has been alluded to by the previous two speakers, absolutely an important one. And we're already on that journey led by Mpesa from Kenya. We've been able to originate $140 billion uh, in terms of economic value through what we're doing with mobile money accounts. Other aspects that we must similarly pay attention to are blockchain to enhance trust and reduce fraud, big data, for data analytics, analytics to close the data challenges that Africa faces. Others are cloud computing, artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, drone technology, which we're using in, in, in bits and pieces, but we need to scale. And most importantly, we must have the environment. We must have the infrastructure to support a revolution that is truly a fourth industrial revolution for the African continent. Africa will not succeed with leveraging women to unleash its full potential if it does not have improvements in all aspects of female representation in politics, in the public sector, and private sector leadership positions. Yes, we're making progress, but we need more significant progress because laws, policies, and, 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 and frameworks are key for this transformation that I'm talking about. Also important is allyship. And I'm grateful to Dr. Laka and all the men who are attending this event and all the sponsors of this event for understanding this journey. You're all champions because you know that leveraging women is good economics. Africa desperately needs good economics because good economics is inclusive. It leverages all of Africa's wealth. Let me close by encouraging you to reflect on how much more you can impact society and how you can prepare yourself for this. Have no doubt one person can make a difference. Many of you know Professor Wangari Matai. She is Africa's first female Nobel Peace Laureate. She started working on climate action, on sustainability, way before most people in the world even knew what these issues were about. I hope that you are inspired as an individual to start to plan how you can make a difference in society and live a lasting legacy like Professor Wangari Matai. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And Arunma, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I just have one question for you. You've covered a lot of ground um, and you touched on the issue about environmental sustainability. We have learned from the COVID experience how quickly a social issue can derail our economies and just take back all the gains we made in terms of enterprise development and poverty eradication. But still, you mentioned the fact about climate change, which remains the greatest risk we face as Africa. What is your wish for the women here with us today? How would you like us to leverage our roles to ensure Africa's sustainable economic development through sustainable finance? Uh, thank you for raising such an important issue, Ms. Mugambi. I do believe, uh, as I shared earlier, that the climate economy is for Africa to take advantage of. It's a $26 trillion economy. We are blessed with a mix of clean energy options. Globally, 
you can create 65 million jobs. I gave the example of South Africa, of Morocco, uh, of the, the, the private sector um, company in Kenya, uh, MCOPA. Absolutely amazing opportunities. We can make sure that we don't have 700,000 premature deaths from air pollution. We can make sure that new business opportunities, whether in food and land use, that we can deliver an annual value of $320 billion. So if you're a banker, look at your portfolio and see how you can support clean energy solutions. If you're an insurance expert, think about some of the disaster risk management opportunities that you can be a part of. The Africa Risk Capacity um, uh, entity has had a few initiatives. The World Bank provides, uh, and the African Development Bank provides support uh, to countries that can be placed on the capital markets. If you're a capital markets expert, you can think about how you can support these clean energy, renewable energy options to provide medium to long-term funding. If you're a private equity expert, you can think about how you can claim these opportunities that are game-changing opportunities uh, for the future. So there are several opportunities, Ms. Mugambi, and, um, and it's really for us uh, to be the first movers uh, in this area because that opportunity exists. So I don't see it as a risk, but I see it rather as an opportunity. Thank you.